Welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. India at UN exposes Pakistan for sponsoring terrorism, calls for unanimity among the member nations. Hybrid terrorists posing new challenge for security forces in Kashmir. And Desperate Taliban seeks global recognition. India, which remains a victim of cross-border terrorism, has time and again raised its concern on the international platforms. New Delhi reiterates its concern on countering terrorism on a global level. Recently, while exposing Pakistan's propaganda at the UNSC debate, India expressed its concern over the lack of unanimity among the member nations. A report. There have been a number of terror attacks in India. From the 2008 Mumbai terror attack to Uri and Fulwama attacks of 2016 and 2019, where the links with the Pakistan based terror groups like the Lashkar e Taiba or Jaish e Mohammed have been established. Other than India, there have been international terror attacks, including the recent Texas attack that has had links with the notorious South Asian country. While Pakistani diplomats say that the country is taking stern action against UN-designated terrorists, Islamabad continues to remain deeply invested in aiding terror. A country that considers Osama bin Laden a martyr always makes desperate attempts to divert attention from criticism of its policies. Propagating false and malicious propaganda against New Delhi has become an inseparable political tool for Pakistan. However, India knows well how to counter its policy and New Delhi has been categorically exposing Pakistan's propaganda on global platforms for several years. Recently, in a strong response to Islamabad breaking up the issue of Jammu and Kashmir in the United Nations, India exposed Pakistan's lies and highlighted how terrorists enjoy free pass in the country. This is not the first time the representative of Pakistan has misused platforms provided by the UN to propagate false and malicious propaganda against my country and seeking in vain to divert the world's attention from the sad, sad state of his country where terrorists enjoy free pass while the lives of ordinary people, especially those belonging to the minorities, are turned upside down. Madam President, member states are well aware that Pakistan has a, an established history of harboring, aiding and actively supporting terrorists. This is a country that has been globally recognized as a sponsor of terrorism and holds the ignoble record of hosting the largest number of terrorists prescribed by the Security Council. So much so that most of the terrorist attacks around the world today have their origin in some form or the other in Pakistan. Time and again, Pakistan misuses the platform of the UN because it is very much aware of the limitations of the global organization. Unfortunately, efforts to adopt an all-encompassing comprehensive counter-terrorism convention have eluded the UN. This is because member states have been unable to agree on a definition of terrorism. In particular, the question of whether the definition should include so-called state terrorism. It does undermine the organization's moral authority by inhibiting it from sending an unequivocal message that terrorism is never an acceptable tactic. Recently in the UNGA meeting, to consider the report of Secretary General on the work of the organization, India raised its concern 
over the issue. Indian diplomats said that terrorism casts doubt on the organization's relevance for people, whom the Charter of UN obliges to protect. Our inability to seriously address terrorism, the most dangerous of scourges faced by states and societies since the Second World War, casts doubt on the relevance of the organization for the very people whom the Charter of the United Nations obliges us to protect. The United Nations has yet to agree on a common definition, let alone craft a coherent, well-coordinated policy to tackle terrorism and dismantle its enabling networks. We have failed ourselves by continuing to procrastinate on concluding a comprehensive convention against international terrorism. The United Nations stands at a crossroads. It has recorded many successes, however, it is bedeviled by a litany of challenges. These challenges weaken its effectiveness. The organization needs to improve its efforts to respond effectively, especially when the world is affected with an evil of terrorism. The past few weeks in Kashmir have witnessed killings of civilians and most of them were shot by pistol-born youth, who are not listed with the security forces. The presence of part-time or hybrid terrorists are now posing a new challenge in the valley. We have a report. Ever since targeted civilian killings rattled Jammu and Kashmir, the region has been hearing about a new kind of combatant known as hybrid militants. Security forces in Kashmir are facing a new challenge on the militancy front. The presence of hybrid militants who are not listed as ultras but persons radicalized enough to carry out a terrorist strike and then slip back into the routine life. Over the past few weeks, the attacks on soft targets in the valley, including in Srinagar, have witnessed a spike. Most of these incidents have been carried out by the pistol-born youth who are not listed as militants with the security agencies. The new trend has sent security agencies into a tizzy as these hybrid militants or part-time militants are very difficult to track and pose a challenge to the security forces. All these overground, underground workers that were there and that are there right now who are engaged in providing logistics, providing shelter and also taking these terrorists, the remaining militant terrorists and all from one place to another are the ones now whom Pakistan is directing that they should pick up a pistol and shoot anyone at random. Now the problem here that has come up is that these terrorists, these people, overground, underground workers do not have any police record because they are not on the police radar. But as soon as they get a message from Pakistan, ISI, these people, they pick up a pistol and go and shoot any one at random. The new trend is happening in the valley on the directions of Pakistan and its spy agency, the ISI. The desperate nexus is modifying methods and the aim is to spread fear and stop businesses in the region. This is why the targets are businessmen, activists, political leaders without protection and off-duty policemen who are unarmed and unlikely to retaliate. Hybrid militants target and silence voices that are speaking against separatism and against the perpetrators and instigators of violence. Security officials say that such type of target is never random. It involves watching movement patterns and finding a weak part of the routine. The spotter could be someone who is not on the police list but has a pistol and intent to kill, just like a mercenary shooter paid to kill a target. There are some challenges with regard to hybrid terrorism. To identify hybrid terrorists, it's a big challenge and to arrest them or stop them for doing any unlawful activities. If that's not possible, 
then neutralizing them in encounters is a big challenge. Security officials in Jammu and Kashmir say that hybrid terrorism could pose the biggest challenge for the year 2022. The biggest challenge today in Kashmir Valley is identifying these hybrid terrorists who are there because these are the people now who are active. Earlier, the gun totting cowboy type militants terrorists have been eliminated and very few of them are there in Kashmir Valley. But these underground overground workers who have been helping the terrorists all through these 30 years are the ones now who are becoming active in militancy. The problem and a headache for the security forces is trying to identify and trying to find out who are these people and where they will strike because these people strike at random there is no set target in mind it is just that any Tom, Dick and Harry who is there on the road could be shot and a message to sent out to the people that look terrorists are still there. Authorities in Kashmir need to tackle the situation from multiple angles. Jammu and Kashmir police and security forces have to work in synergy as hard intelligence is required to tackle the situation. There is an urgent need to break the chain of these attacks. The swift takeover of Afghanistan by Taliban was a culmination of cunning and conspiratorial moves by Pakistan's inter-services intelligence. It is unlikely that the South Asian country will end its support to Taliban. Islamabad, which is now raising hurdles in India's humanitarian outreach to Afghans, knows very well that the militants' control of Afghanistan accentuates the jihadist threat at home. Take a look. Pakistan has a unique relationship with Afghanistan. They share a 2,570-kilometer border. There are numerous cultural, ethnic and religious connections. However, Pakistan has not been seen by all as a firm ally in the battle against jihadist terrorism. It has been long accused by many in the United States and elsewhere of providing support for the Taliban, something it denies. After the 9-11 attacks that were planned in Afghanistan, Pakistan positioned itself as an ally of the US in the so-called War on Terror. But at the same time, parts of the country's military and intelligence establishment maintained links with Islamist groups in Afghanistan like the Taliban. Those links, so it is claimed, at times turned into a significant material and logistical support. That Pakistan has washed its hands of any responsibility for what is going on in uh, Afghanistan. Um, there are people who are on the record um, uh, in the past uh, 10 or 15 years who have said that they were supporters of the Taliban, funders, armors, um, whatever, and uh, uh, that the takeover, most recently in Owen, ben Owen Bennett Jones' excellent um, BBC radio uh, program, um, that the takeover of, of Afghanistan was an implicit aim of uh, Pakistan's intelligence and military establishment. Um, I think that denials aside, their involvement and responsibility for what has happened in Afghanistan in the past, well, let's say five months, but certainly 20 years. Over the last three decades, Pakistan has viewed the Taliban as serving a twofold purpose. First, a Taliban regime in Kabul and its umbilical connection with Pakistan would ensure the Pakistan military a free pass over Afghanistan, while ensuring Pakistan agency over Afghan routes into Central Asia. And therefore, Islamabad views India as an obstacle. Pakistan does not want any Indian presence in Afghanistan, including the continuance of its substantial aid program in the country. It would prefer the Afghan trade with India is not resumed. This may not be in accord with some factions of Taliban, in particular the Doha faction led by Mullah brother. But the Haqqani group 
may be counted upon to support the Pakistan agenda. In and of itself could never provide aid because Pakistan would never grant it overland routes. Pakistan, from the beginning of this conflict, you know, this isn't the first time. I mean, this this famine in Afghanistan is not new. It, it has been going on for well over a decade. It's that news of the conflict always crowded out news of the famine. Pakistan uh, never let India uh, transit food products. And India had actually took its excess wheat, made these highly nutritious. I'm not sure how delicious they were, but nonetheless, highly uh, nutritious cookies, for lack of a better word, to distribute to um, Afghan children in particular. And Pakistan, no, we're not going to let you transit over route through Pakistani territory. And so this was why the Chabahar port in Iran was so central to Indian interests, right? Because through Chabahar, it could offload Indian relief and then transit those goods uh, into Afghanistan. While there is a smug satisfaction in Pakistan at the proxy victory in Afghanistan, many are also warning of blowback. Although the Afghan Taliban may be beholden to Pakistan for all the help rendered over the years, there is concern in the Pakistan army that some sections of the Taliban may be difficult to bring to heel. Mullah brother jailed by Pakistan for eight years for being independent-minded may represent one possible friction point. The Taliban as a new US ploy against China to keep the region de-established and prevent the Belt and Road's initiative from taking shape is another responsibility that concerns Pakistan. Since it took power in August, the Taliban has been on a desperate quest to have its Islamic Emirate recognized internationally as the official government of Afghanistan. But most of the nations are not in a hurry to announce the formal acknowledgement of the Taliban as the rightful rulers of the country. Take a look. The de facto leaders of Afghanistan, failing to achieve recognition of their government, have launched a global outreach with members of the Taliban meeting Western officials since the group took control of Afghanistan. With millions of Afghans at risk of starvation this winter, as poverty deepens, Norway recently facilitated a series of meetings held in Oslo over three days. Norwegian foreign ministry officials met representatives of Afghanistan's Taliban rulers for talks on how to alleviate the country's humanitarian crisis. Norway and its NATO allies do not formally recognize the Taliban-led administration that seized power last year, but see talks as a necessity given the depth of the crisis. The Taliban have repeatedly expressed the expectation that the international community will recognize their authority as the new government of Afghanistan and have taken several procedural steps to pursue recognition. But the group has done very little to demonstrate a willingness to meet the conditions put forward by Western powers and some regional states. The Taliban have imposed widespread restrictions, many of them directed at women. Women have been banned from many jobs outside the health and education fields. Their access to education has been restricted beyond the sixth grade and they have been ordered to wear the hijab. Hard-won gains in women's rights over the last two decades have been quickly reversed. However, the Taliban still vow to respect women's rights despite all the contradictory evidence. We believe on their roles, but every country has their own culture and based on their uh, laws, based on their religious values, uh, no one can deny from their rights. Absolute, absolutely, Afghan government is trying to provide that type of environment for them and they will take a part on rebuilding of their country. Since the Taliban took power in August, replacing the US-backed Afghan government, millions of women and girls have been out of work and out of school. There are few clear answers as to when, if at all, they will return to their jobs and classrooms. Still, women have continued to take to the streets in a courageous show of defiance as their rights have been stripped away. 
However, these protests are swiftly shut down by the Taliban, who also detain and beat Afghan journalists who cover the demonstrations to limit the media attention. The head of the Norwegian Refugee Council therefore expressed his disappointment with the Taliban government in the crucial meeting, which was joined by Britain, France, Germany, as well as Italy. We must have full equality between the genders. We have many hundred women ansatte who must have full tilgang til menneskene som uh, vi skal hjelpe. Uh, vi kan ikke acceptera at det fortsatt noen steder uh, skal kvinnelige ansatte ha en, 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 en mannlig slektning med sig. Det, det, det er ødeleggende for arbeidet vårt. Kanskje et hovedbudskap til uh, Motaki og de andre lederne her er at det de har lovet i Kabul til oss, blant annet til mig i september da jeg var der, har ikke blitt en realitet i en del av provinsene. The Taliban is wasting no time in stamping out human rights. LGBT people in Afghanistan and others who do not conform to rigid gender norms have faced an increasingly desperate situation and grave threats to their safety and lives. The Taliban have echoed the previous government's support for the criminalization of same-sex relations with some of their leaders vowing to take a hard line against the rights of LGBT people. There is an uncertain future ahead of Afghans, but still, evacuation will not be an option for most people. It is challenging for those who face persecution on any grounds to obtain the documentation and financial resources needed to leave the country. For Afghans who cannot or choose not to leave the country, it is urgent that their rights be protected within Afghanistan. The Taliban should end abuses against common Afghans and revise laws and regulations to ensure their equal rights. United Nations bodies and concerned governments should use whatever diplomatic leverage they have with the Taliban to do so. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.